I want to jump right into what um, God's been stirring in my heart this week, and um, I'm excited about it. I hope you walk away ministered by it, but um, I want to talk about encouragement today, and um, we all love a good timing, like a good timed encouragement, right? Like a text at the right time, like that can just be man, bring such peace and comfort. It can be soul-changing for you. I mean, it is just uh, so important. And uh, what we're going to study today and go through today is just finding out how essential that is to the walk of, a, of, of someone who claims to be a Christian and a believer, is the encouragement of one another. And, um, and so, and actually, I was so blessed this morning. I got, I got three texts right away this morning encouraging me for today. And I just thought, that's just, God's just so cool how he does that. And so um, let's just pray together and enter in. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day, and we thank you for an opportunity to come together and enter into your presence and to learn and to grow as a community, Lord. And may, um, may you work in me and through me, Heavenly Father. May it be your words and not mine, but may um, your heart be conveyed to these people today. May they walk away encouraged. May I walk away encouraged in the things of you. In your name I pray. Amen. So our text today is going to come out of Ephesians if you want to start turning there. And we're going to go to Ephesians 4, and we're going to hop around a little bit in that book. But um, this summer, I will have been in the ministry for 15 years. And um, I was setting and thinking about that yesterday because I was doing the math. And one, there's no way that I'm that old, but I am. And um, I graduated high school in 03, and right away I... Um, was so honored and privileged and invited to come become a missionary in Mexico and work with Bobby and Lynn Crow. Many of you guys know them. We support them. And um, for those of you who don't know, John David's out and doing amazing and, and things are going great there. But, um, uh, and I was just really privileged to be there. And um, in the last 15 years, um, there's been a lot of growing pains. And there's been a lot of things that I've had to relearn and things that I've laid down. You guys have had to witness that. And I am sorry for things that you've had to see in the last 15 years. But um, ideas and theologies that I may have had that I've laid aside, that I've picked up new ones, um, pain that you go through. I mean, like, let's all pause and look back over 15 years, and so much can change in 15 years of your life. And um, there's a lot of things in the mission field that were huge blessings to me, and a lot of things that were lessons to me of how I wouldn't want to do things. And that's, you know neither here nor there, but um, it was such a, an incredible experience of life. But one of the things that Bobby Crow, um, who was our lead pastor there, and he was head of the missions, and he invited me to come live uh, with them and work in a school uh, that they had there. And then also they went out and did crusades consistently throughout the year. But then the summer, we had groups from um, all over the country of the, in the United States that would bring a group from their church and they would do a mission and then we'd hold crusades in tents and do revivals um, every night. And so um, I, he, he gave me about a month to settle in and he came to me one night and he goes, I want you to give a word of exhortation. Do you know what that is? And I go, no, I don't. And he goes, well, basically it's a word of encouragement. And so I want you to open up this um, revival meeting with a word of encouragement for the crowd, which... Um, you don't tell him no, but I was nervous as all get out. And yet at the same time as I was preparing and studying for it, um, I was very excited that that's the job he gave me, that that's the role that he gave me, a word of encouragement. Um, I'm not an evangelistic type. I'm not going to scream fire, hell, and brim. I'm not, that wasn't my cup of tea. Uh, I wasn't going to tell them how they were all wrong. But to get up there and encourage someone, that seemed exciting to me. And so um, that became my job in the summer uh, at these crusades. After we set up, that would be my part of the, of the service. And I look back, and I was thinking about it last night, and I had to look up exhortation one more time to make sure that I was getting it right. And I was like, what, what an honor it was that he gave me that, that he taught me how to do that right away in my ministry, is to give a word of encouragement to the crowd. And, um, and I've carried that with me, and my heart is always that when I do speak in places or when I speak with my SELA kids or with you guys, that people leave encouraged. I want that. If, if you've ever felt not, I apologize. I must have been having a bad day. Like, my heart is that you leave encouraged. And I think that as fellow believers and people who follow Christ, it is our job, it is our calling, it is a part of us, whatever, however you want to say it, for us to leave people feeling 
encouraged when they leave our presence. And I realize that that's a tall order and that that doesn't always happen. And that's okay. And it's okay that you're going to fail. And it's okay that I'm going to fail. I am not going to leave everyone encouraged every time they're around me. But that bottom line, that is a part of us as followers of Christ. And so we're gonna, when we read on Ephesians today, Paul wrote this from a prison cell in Rome. And if you read the first, which is a huge lesson in and of itself right there, that he is writing letters to other people when he's at a low place in his life. What some of us would say, one of the lowest places you can go in prison. And he was writing letters of encouragement to churches. And remember, the church was young at this time. And um, he was sending encouragement out to people. And sometimes words of correction, yes. But if you read the first couple chapters of Ephesians, which I really encourage you to do, I've just been getting so much out of it. The first two chapters is Paul reminding the people who they are in Christ, what Christ has done for them, and what Christ has done in them, and who they are. And I think what a beautiful picture of what we can do for the people around us is remind them who they are. You know, when you have a friend going through a really hard time, it's real easy sometimes to sit and, and, and join them in their sorrow, which is we're so called to do. But remind them who they are. Remind them what Christ has done for them. Remind them the price they paid. Remind them the love that, ha- that God has for them. And because we all need reminded. I've done this for 15 years, and I'll need reminded tomorrow morning of who I am in Christ, what God says about me, what he believes about me, how he sees me versus how I see myself. I'll need reminded several times in this next week. We all do because our human nature just fights so hard. To the, we fight that mental fight of how we see ourselves versus how God sees ourselves. And so um, Paul is writing and encouraging And then now as we get into chapter 4 is where we're going to start. And in verse 17, he is um, encouraging them how to walk out this this life in, in, in the Christian way. And so in 17 it says, So this I say and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart, and they having become calloused, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. He's telling us we've got to guard our hearts against the things that so easily can take us out in this world. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in, is in Jesus that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in according, accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, falsehood, sorry, falsehood speak truth each one of you with his neighbor, For we are members of one another. Be angry, yet do not sin, and do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity. As I was reading this yesterday, I'm going to pause right here, but as I was reading this yesterday, I really felt like the Holy Spirit was telling me, don't, when it says, don't give the devil an opportunity, don't let shame take a place in your life. One of the biggest tools that the devil uses that is very effective on all of us is shame. Because shame keeps us from doing what God's asked us to do. Shame keeps us from seeing ourselves the way that God sees us. Shame uh, keeps us from seeing other people the way that God sees them. And so don't let shame in that door. Um, Sorry, I lost my place. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. And then finally in verse 32, be kind to one another 
tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. In humanity, we have this really good tendency of looking at somebody else's life and, and having an opinion of how they should live it, having an opinion of what they've done wrong, having an opinion of um, what they could be doing better, how what they're doing is affecting you. And that uh, is, happens to all of us. We all have that urge to judge someone else. But if we're going to be different than the world, which is what in verse 17 he's talking about, to separate yourself, to be different than the way of the Gentiles, to, to, take, to put on your new self, then we have to lay those opinions down. And we have to lay those judgments aside. And we have to start seeing people the way that Christ has seen them. And, then, and when we do that, then we are, are filled up with the urge and, the, and the, the great joy of expressing God's love to them. Does that make sense? When I can sit and I can see how God sees me and how he sees his people, I don't have to force myself to be kind to someone. The more I dwell on that, like Tammy's saying, the more time I spend with the Heavenly Father and the more um, um, educated I get on what his opinion of me is, then it becomes far easier to offer that opinion to other people. It's far easier to look at his creation and say, I love you right where you are. I love you in the midst of your mess or in, in this great victory that you have in your life. But we are then able to encourage those who are around us. But like Tammy was talking about, I can't offer a lot of encouragement to anybody around me if I have not discovered who I am myself. And if I have not discovered God's opinion of me and those he has created, I can't offer a whole lot. Because if I haven't spent that time and I haven't filled myself up, then I'm just trying to keep my head above water. Because I'm fighting the thoughts of shame. And I'm fighting the thoughts of rejection. And I'm fighting the, I just can't get my life together for one second. And then that's how I'm seeing everyone else around me. And so that time, that time she's talking about spending with the Heavenly Father is crucial. It is important. And unfortunately, it's not a one-time thing and then you've got it mastered. It's, it's not a course you take and take the test and move on. It is something every day you have to remind yourself of. Every day you get a bigger um, glimpse of who he is, a clearer picture of what his desire is. And the more you do that, the easier it is to forgive. The easier it is to be kind to one another. The easier it is to be what Christ has asked us to be on this earth, which is love, and, and to extend grace to other people. And so um, in this chapter, he's not only reminding us what is offered to us, but he's equipping us to go out and do the same for other people and to be encouragers. So how can we be a good encouragers? One, we do have to be different than the world. Now, um, I was telling my silly kids this the other day because they get a kick out of it, but um, there's lots of battles that I've been fighting and I win, and I'm really excited about that. But one, and especially when like it comes to like my thoughts towards other people, that's an ongoing battle, right? When someone cuts in line at the grocery store, it gets a little frustrating. And for a really long time, I thought I had an absolute right to be frustrated with them. Well, they cut in front of me. I have an absolute right to glare at them. I have an absolute right to say something snarky. I have that right. And um, the older I get and the more times you've had that happen to you, you're like, why are we treating each other this way? Like, this is just ridiculous. What a waste of time. And so honestly, I can say, like, when I go out and things get a little tense with my kids and somebody does something, I really have, like, they don't mean to do that. I have such a butter thought life towards these people. I really do. But in one area that I have lacked growth in is driving. Are you with me on the interstate? Let's talk about people who are driving. Like, come on, people. You're going to hit me because you're on your phone. It doesn't matter that I just text someone. But anyway, you're on your phone. And, um, you know, just the, the idiotic things that happen on the road. And I find myself saying the most ridiculous things to people who will never hear them. <laughs> but um, I find myself becoming agitated and angry and just, like, so critical of these people. And it's like, why am I doing that? Well, here's the thing. We live in a society where we're all doing that. 
We're all doing that. We're all looking at each other through a critical lens. Of, well, if they wouldn't have done that, well, if you didn't. Like one of the things that I just the other night that I told, like Heavenly Father helped me break this, was my little girl came up to me after she did something she was not supposed to do and got hurt. And I said, you weren't supposed to do that. I didn't offer her love. <laughs> I didn't offer her affection. To be quite honest, I, wasn't even, I didn't even care that she got hurt. I told you not to do that. And it's like, she knows I told her not to do that. Why inflict more shame in that moment? And yet that's what a lot of us do. And that's what humanity is doing. You read the blogs and you look at social media. And it is everyone saying how everyone else should be doing something better. And so if we are going to be followers of Christ, if we are going to be examples of him, we cannot operate in those same manners. We cannot do what the rest of the world is doing. We have to be different. We have to be, um, we have to be different. We have to encourage. We have to put those opinions aside. We have to put, take those thoughts captive. And when the temptation comes to be rude and negative, we fight that and, be, and say something positive in the moment. So we do. We have to be different than what's going on around us. I was just thinking about this the other day, and I really did feel bad. I was trying to load my kids into the, um, into the car, and I was sitting at the gas station, and I realized that I'd had my door open a really long time, just trying to put everything in, and I looked, and a lady was sitting in her car, because she couldn't get out, because my door was open, just glaring at me. Like, I had ruined us. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'll get in my car now. You know, and I looked at her, and I just thought, oh, man. One, I felt really bad that I did make her wait. But two, I thought, I'm so glad I'm fighting those urges now. To not look at someone and go, you just ruined my day. That's not their responsibility. Their responsibility is not to keep me happy and not to get in my way and not to ruin my life. My responsibility is to love them and to encourage them and for them to leave my presence feeling better than when they came in. And so, two, we have to protect our own heart from the potential of getting calloused due to the disappointments and heartache that we've had in our lives. He talks about that, about how people who become calloused and hurt, then it's like, um, it's like we give up, right? We've all had this area in our lives where You've just been disappointed time and time again. I've tried to not glare at the lady who's kept me trapped in my car. I've tried to do this, and it just hasn't worked. I tried to be kind, and they were rude back. And then what happens is if we don't take those issues right away to the Heavenly Father and say, okay, can you speak truth to this? Or, Lord, well, you know, what are you saying about this situation? Then if we harbor on, on those and we hide them in our heart, we start becoming calloused. We start building up these walls. We have to remain sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And we have to remain sensitive to what God is trying to do in us and through us. And oftentimes that means that even though we've had our heart broken a few times, we hand that heart over to Christ and say, will you fix it? He gives it back to us and we go right back out there. We go right back out to loving people, even though we know we might get rejected, even though we know we might fail and we, we might say something and they might not take it the right way, whatever it is. But we have to guard our heart so that we can remain sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is saying in us and what he wants to say through us to other people. This last um, couple weeks ago in Sila, I encouraged them. Uh, we're reading the first two chapters of Ephesians and how Paul's just encouraging the people and reminding them who they are and uh, reminding them how they were created. And I challenged them to text one person that week and just encourage them who they were in Christ. Which, the look of terror that came on their face. Well, can I just say hi? Nope. It's got to be some kind of encouragement. Can I say that? Nope. Remind them who they are in Christ. And um, it was exciting to see the few that came back and said they did it. Because, you know, there is a risk to being an encourager. Because oftentimes what you say can be rejected and what you say can maybe be twisted or used against you later so we got to protect our hearts but the reason we do it is not for our benefit the reason we do it is because if they can get a glimpse if they can be reminded 
of who Christ is in them and what he says about them. And if I can encourage them on their path, wow, isn't that exciting to think about them getting a full realization of who God is in their life? I think of the moments that I've been down and out and a random text, email, card, or phone call comes and I go, like they know they will never know because I can't tell them right now how crucial that was right now in my life. And that's what we've been called to be to other people. And three, we must speak truth. We must speak truth in people's life. And that doesn't mean that we tell them how they've done everything wrong. That's the truth. The truth is how you've done everything wrong. No, the, we have to be careful how we speak the truth. The truth that our jo- that's our job to speak is, again, pointing them back to what God says about them and how God sees them. That's the truth. Because we all see ourselves through um, clouded lenses. We all see ourselves through distorted ways. We all see ourselves through our own failures and mistakes. We all do that. We're our own biggest critics. We need people in our lives to remind us how God sees us and what, and what he says we can do and who he says we can be. We all need that. And so we must speak truth to one another. When someone says, I just can't go on, no, that's not the truth. Christ said that he'd be with you and he'd fight with you and you can win this battle. We have to speak truth to people. And so, um, again, though, if I, in order to know the truth, I have to know what the Heavenly Father's saying. I have to know what he says about me. And four, deal with the anger and shame in our own hearts. And I said this, I felt, and I wrote it in my Bible, and I don't do that very often, but at that scripture verse where it says, don't give the devil an opportunity, I said, don't give shame an opportunity. Shame is a battle we will fight every day of our lives, but when it puts its, when it grabs you, it is debilitating at times. It is frustrating, and we must deal with that shame in our own hearts. Shame has kept me from doing what I know God's asked me to do. I, was, I had this moment last night, too, and I actually was sitting in praise and worship and going, oh, I didn't ever go back to that. I wish I would have. But I was sitting and preparing, and I felt like God told me to text a friend and check how they are doing and then invite them to today. And um, I'm not real good at that. I'm not real good at inviting because I don't want to be rejected. And I had all these thoughts of why I shouldn't say it. And I had all these thoughts of how it could be misinterpreted and, and all these things. And I wrote the text out, and I had like this, I don't feel right. So I put my phone down, and I was going to come back to it. I was going to do it. And in praise and worship today, I was realizing that I didn't ever do it. And it's like our shame and our embarrassment, our fear keeps us from doing things that the Holy Spirit has asked us to do. And, you know, God's grace is so big, it covers that. And he, he, he doesn't look at you and go, oh, you messed up again. But we miss out on being a blessing to other people when we don't listen to what he's saying to us. And it is risky, and it is scary, but it's so worth taking that step and doing what he said to do. And so deal with that stuff that keeps you from doing what he's asked you to do. We all have it. So don't go, oh, yeah, I'm the one that really has to deal with that. That's what she's, no, we all have it. We all have something keeping us from being fully engaged with what God is asking us to do and fully committed to what he's asking us to do. We all have it. And, um, and, but the key is to deal with it, to push through it. And I will tell you this, those times that I've pushed through that embarrassment and that worry and that, that feeling of being scared, it's always worth it to do what he's asked us to do. Whether you ever find out that it blessed them or not, that's not the point. But to do what the Holy Spirit's asked you to do, there is nothing better than being able to say, I did it, Heavenly Father. I have no idea what's going to happen now, but I did it. And um, there's peace. There's peace in doing what God's asked you to do. And then five, do not pick and choose who to encourage and who not to encourage. Um. I look back in my life, and um, 
I don't know if you've ever watched The Office, but Michael Scott in The Office is one uncomfortable person to watch, right? My dad can't even handle it, and it cracks me up. Like, if you want to torture him, put on The Office. Like, because he just can't even handle Michael Scott's personality, which Michael Scott is a very confident person in himself, very much thinks he's the greatest guy on the earth and the biggest gift to mankind. And, um, you know, he doesn't need you to encourage him. He's going to encourage himself. And so uh, he's awkward to watch. And I look back over the course of my life, and there's been people in our life that are, like, awkward to watch, right? And you kind of, like, cringe as you're watching them live, and you're just like... <gasps> I just can't, I can't, because I'm uncomfortable by it. And I've looked at my life and how many times, like, I've separated myself because I just, like, it's just too uncomfortable to watch. I just don't know what's going to happen. And, you know, that is so contrary to the heart of God. His heart is that we embrace everyone. And one of the biggest lessons I've learned is that not everyone has to be like me, think like me, see things like me for me to be their friend. Not everyone has to be interested in the exact same things I'm interested in order for me to be their friend. They really just want someone to ask them how their day is going and listen to their heartache and listen to what, uh, um, what, what wisdom they've caught on to and what victories they have in their life. And I can do that. We can do that. We can listen to the people that maybe don't see things the same way as we do or really live their life really different than how we would live ours, but we can still sit with them, fellowship with them, and encourage them. And so I encourage you, don't just pick. It's really easy to encourage our best friend. It's not always easy to encourage the, the person that we meet in the store that's just, you can tell they're just a mess and falling apart. But I encourage you, don't pick and choose who that is. Whoever's in your life for this season, that's who you are to just encourage and love and be a blessing to. And maybe they're not here forever, but for the season, man, be all that you can be to that person. Be a, a, a light to them and an encouragement to them. Because what if there's no one else in their life that's being an encouragement to them at that moment? What if you are the one that... Um, that encourages them along on their path. Um, my dad tells a story. Uh, Gable one time was in a meeting with him, and they were just praying, and Gable was like, I just see, like, all these leaves, and we kick them. The wind catches them, and then carries them on. And my dad's really grabbed hold of it, and he brings it up a lot, and he brings it up a lot to me and encourages me that not everyone in our path is going to be a leaf that stays with us forever. Some of them we just encourage, and the wind catches them, and they carry them on to new things. But may my words be encouragement, not discouragement. May my words be like, you can do whatever's coming your way. You can handle it rather than telling them how they're doing everything wrong. That's not, that's, that's not uh, uplifting. But may I encourage them that wherever their journey is. And the other thing is I have to lay down my opinion of what their journey is and let them discover it for themselves. And that's between them and the Heavenly Father. But may I be an encouragement that they can attain it, that they can, they can win these battles. And may I just be a little bit more of a push down the journey, down the, down the road that they're on. And um, what a great gift that is to be in the body of Christ. Rather than sit around and we argue about theology and we argue about this and that and we are really good at telling people how they shouldn't live their lives, but are we really good at telling them that what they're doing right in their lives? Are we really good at telling them that uh, what, what, what Christ has said about them? Are we good about that? Are we only doing and are we only saying things that make them feel bad about what they're doing? They already feel bad. We're all bond we all have shame in our lives. May I be the one that breaks that. May I be the one that doesn't pile shame on to someone, but lifts it and, and eases the burden that they're under for a moment so that they can catch their breath and they can go down the path that God's placed them on. And my opinion of their path doesn't matter. But what God is speaking to them, if I can encourage them and remind them of that. That's huge. That place, that is what we've been called to be and do in the body of Christ. And we sometimes get caught up in all these other things that what it should be. But that's bottom line. We were called to love one another and embrace them. And sometimes the people that are in your life right now, sometimes you are the person who's just a mess. And thank God for the people who embrace you in that moment and encourage you. And maybe there's people in your life right now that you go, they're a, 
they're a mess or maybe they're a man, they have a victory and I wish I was in that place. May we embrace the people in our lives where they are right at this moment and love them and encourage them and speak the truth to them. May I not let the shame and anger and disappointments of my own life keep me from being a vessel that the Holy Spirit wants to use. Because we all miss out then. Then the body of Christ is just really hurting. Because all we're doing is pointing fingers instead of trying to ease the burden that's on each one of us and reminding us who we are. Um, I'm going to have Seth put up a picture in just a moment on the screen. But um, he looks at me like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, I thought I told you about that. It's in the PowerPoint. But before he does that, um, this is a little glimpse into our family life. And I know um, you guys have been so gracious and you've listened to a lot of stories from myself and from my father and spe specifically about our family. And the reason we do that is we have lots of stories, but they're not always stories for us to tell. There's lots of times we meet with people and they're going through things, but those stories aren't for us to tell. Um, so one, that's where we are very cautious. But two, I mean, it's just easier to tell our own stories. And the other thing is we've committed to be real. And so you've seen me. In the past, course of the last 15 years, you've seen me be real. Um, I'm not a performer. I wish I was. Um, I wear my emotions on my sleeve. You've seen me real. But we've committed that if we are going to be um, in the church and if we're going to be in the ministry, we're going to be real about it. And that means that some days we're doing really good and some days we're not. And so you've heard lots of personal stories and I really appreciate your patience because I'm sure some days you're like, I don't want to hear one more story about that old man, Daryl. But today you're going to hear another one. And so um, in this picture is my grandpa and he's 99 years old. And he's been in my care this week until Friday when my Aunt Kay showed up. Hallelujah. But, um, and, my uncle, and my cousin Luke is doing great. And he's, but um, during the day, it was my job to make sure he lived. And that was a big, big job. No, but, um, and I have cousin Sarah helped, and it, it went really well. But um, uh, I would go up and feed him lunch, which he was usually very disappointed in. in the, and, uh, and so I'd be like, aren't you going to eat anything? And he didn't really want to eat. But on Friday, we went up, and I couldn't find him at first, but then I saw, because it was like 50 degrees, beautiful that day, he was out in the sun. And um, I had this brilliant idea of what to make him for lunch. I was like, because we have controlled his diet for a while, and I'm sure you all know that. But anyway, um, I looked in my fridge, and I'm like, what am I going to feed him? He hasn't eaten anything for me all week. Um, and I saw I have bread, and I have bacon. This is going to be good. I'm going to make this guy a BLT today. And I went up there and go, do you want a BLT? And he goes, oh, you know, I guess, maybe. Okay, well, I'm going to go make you a BLT. And he goes, okay. So I went inside, and Olivia was really kind of chit-chatting and kind of um, annoying me, to be honest with you, and was talking about some kind of chair. And I'm like, I don't know, Livy, just go find it, okay? And so I go in the kitchen, and I look up, and she had found a chair to go sit by her grandpa. Here's the thing about my 99-year-old 90 -year grandpa, and you've got to hear a lot of these stories, but in the last year, he's really questioned who he is. He's really questioned who God is. In the course of his life, he's done a lot of really awesome things, but he's really kind of been really ornery too at times. Um, he's snapped at people. He's maybe been ungrateful. Then other times, he's just like the nicest guy I've ever met. But you know, my little three-year-old didn't care about any of that. She didn't care that when she went and sat by him, he didn't look and think it was as adorable as I did. She didn't care. She didn't care that cancer's taken a piece of his ear away, that bothers him and might bother other people. She didn't care. She didn't care that, you know, they didn't have a long conversation. She just wanted to sit by her grandpa and be in his presence. And in a lot of ways, you could look at the things he's gone through and go, it's been a rough year. It's a little bit of a mess. But she didn't care. She doesn't care at all. She just wanted to be in his presence. And what a beautiful picture of how our Heavenly Father is with us. He does not care that your life is messy right now. He doesn't care that maybe you actually got it together. 
He just wants to be in your presence. He just wants to be with you. And he wants to offer a word of encouragement to you. And maybe it's not even saying much. Maybe it's just you know that he's beside you. But what an amazing gift that is to know the creator of the universe just wants to be with me, loves me for who I am, sees all my scars, sees all my failures, and still wants to sit with me. How can we not go out and be that to other people? How can we not sit with someone in their mess and love them anyway? And say, I'm laying aside my opinion of how it could have been, should have been. I just want to be with you. Because I love you for no other reason than I've been loved. Why should I not love someone else? I've been forgiven. Why should I not forgive someone else? I've been set free. Why should I not encourage someone on their path of being set free? And so I want to close today reading the beginning part of Ephesians, and it's on the Message Bible, and it's just to encourage us to do what, to finish out what God's asked us to do. And it says this, In light of all this, here's what I want you to do. While I'm locked up in here, a prisoner for the master, I want you to get out there and walk. Better yet, run on the road God called you to, I don't want any of you sitting around on your hands. I don't want anyone strolling off down some path that goes nowhere. And mark that you do this with humility and discipline, not in fits and starts, but steadily pouring yourselves out for each other in acts of love, alert and noticing differences and quick at mending fences. You were all called to travel on the same road and in the same direction, so stay together both outwardly and inwardly. You have one master, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who rules over all, works through all, and is, in, is present in all. Everything you are and think and do is permeated with oneness. But that doesn't mean you should all look and speak and act the same. Out of the generosity of Christ, each of us is given his own gift. So go out there and use it and encourage them. So will you just stand with me as we close in prayer today? Heavenly Father, we read in the scripture that you've commanded us to be your hands of feet. And we don't take it as some mysterious text. We take it as truth that we have been called to go out and to love people around us, encourage people around us, and as we do that, we know that every step we take to do that for others, you will build us up and encourage us along the way. May we lay down our shame, our guilt, our condemnation that thinks that, that speaks the lies in our heart and in our minds that we're, you're just not good enough. You don't even have it all together. Don't go tell someone else how, how great God is when you don't even have your life together yet. No, we're going to break through those barriers and we're going to go and be a light to the people around us. We're going to love those who need love. We're going to encourage those who need encouragement. And we are going to be your hands and feet in this earth. In your name I pray. Amen. Great week.